Hi, so in this second part of Python logging, we're going to now dig into the code itself. So this is a follow-up of my previous video on demystifying Python logging concepts. Now, if you haven't watched it and you're not already familiar with Python logging concepts, such as log records, log levels, loggers, logger trees, handlers, formatters, filters, and things like that, then I recommend that you watch that video first because I basically explain all these concepts and how they fit together into Python's built-in logging system. This video is basically going to take those concepts and apply them using code. So first, in the readme that you'll find in the Git repo associated with this blog, you'll find the various important links that we're going to look at. And then we're going to essentially walk through a series of examples. So we'll start with a simple example so in the first example, we're going to just create the root logger and we're also going to see how we can inspect the root logger to get some of its properties. In example number two, we're going to create our application logger on top of the root logger. As I mentioned in the previous video, we don't really log directly to the root logger. We configure the root logger, but we log to a different logger and then things trickle up essentially to the root logger. So in example two, we'll set that up using a YAML file configuration. So using that dict config. In example three, I'll show you how to actually do this using code if you don't want to use dict config for some reason. Then example four, we'll set up a regular file handler. And example five, we'll do a rotating file handler. And then we'll look at how we can set up multiple handlers and attach them to loggers. We'll then look at how we can customize the string formatter how we can use the extra parameter. We'll look at creating custom filters. We'll also look at creating custom formatters. For example, if you want to output JSON data as opposed to just a plain kind of you know text string, then we'll look at how we can suppress logging exceptions for production because what can happen with your code is that the logging itself could potentially cause exceptions. What do you want to happen? Right? You don't want, obviously, your app to stop running, and it won't, but what do you want to do with those exceptions? So we'll take a look at that in example 11. And then in example number 12, I'll show you how to set up and use multiple loggers if you want to use multiple loggers in your application. Maybe you have a larger application and you want to have loggers for different sections, or maybe, you know, sometimes even for each individual module. I'll show you how to set that up. All right, so let's dig in. Okay, so we do a get logger call. So the get logger has no name in here. So that is going to get us the root logger. And we're going to inspect it. We're going to look at does it have any handlers and what is its effective log level. I'm also going to print out the numerical value for warning because get effective level is going to give us a numerical value. So let's go ahead and run this. And as you can see, the root logger has no handlers. And the effective level is 30, which as we can see is warning. Now, I did mention in the previous video that there are no handlers attached to the root logger. And what the logging library will do then is it will use the last resort handler. It's essentially going to say, okay, well, I don't have any handlers. I'm go still going to try and output something somewhere. And for that, it's going to use that last resort handler. The last resort handler isn't going to do much except just send the message, the, deb the, the logging message to the console, right? So let's take a look at that. If we run this, well, I need to uncomment it first. Now the default for the last resort is turned on, right? So I'm gonna leave that commented right now. So the last resort is enabled. If we run this, you'll see that we get the warning error and critical message. This is because our root logger has a level of warning. So we're only going to see warning and higher, which is warning error and critical in this case. But as you can see, it does output the message to the console. Now we can also turn off the last resort handler. Now, when we do this, this changes a little bit. We still, you know, we don't get an exception. Our, our application keeps running. Logging really shouldn't break your application. If something goes wrong in logging, you don't want it to break your, your app. But here what it does, because there are no handlers now, no, there's no handlers attached to the root, and we turned off the last resort handler, 
we essentially just get a single message, even though we, you know, did uh, six or five different logs. And of course, since the level is warning, we only expect three to show. We only get the single message in our console that no handlers could be found for the root logger. Okay, so this is example number one. That's how you get the root logger. That's how you can inspect loggers. You can check if they have handlers, effective levels, check the documentation. There's a lot of other things that you can inspect on your existing loggers. So let's move on to example number two. Now for example number two, we are going to configure two loggers, the root logger and an app logger. So in our first configuration, we're going to do the following. We're going to define a console handler and a custom string formatter. So we are going to use logging to the console, but we're going to customize the string. We are then going to attach that handler to the root logger only. We're not going to attach it to our application logger. We're going to attach it to the root logger. And then we're going to set that logger level. We'll set it to, let's say, debug. Then we're going to define the app logger and we're going to set its level to info with no handlers, but with propagation turned on, which is the default. So again, if you don't understand propagation and everything I've said here, please go back and look at the first video that I have on Python logging. So let's take a look at the actual configuration, because a lot of setting up of uh, logging in Python is done via configuration. So one thing that you need in your configuration dictionary, here I'm using YAML, you could use JSON or could, you could use a Python dictionary too, is to set the version. And this is basically the logging library is looking at this to potentially future proof if there's you know, major changes in how you configure things. So right now it is still version one. I don't know if it will ever change, but you do need to specify it. Now, another thing, and I mentioned that in the previous video, we're going to disable existing loggers. I don't want any, you know, for example, I may be using libraries and those libraries may be doing something funny with the logging that they're not supposed to. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to ask the Python logging to turn off everything that's already there, right? So basically start with a clean slate. Now, this is the default. So you don't actually need to specify this in the config. I just wanted to point out here that you could turn it off if you wanted to, but in general, we leave it on, right? So you actually don't need this line. Now we need to define a logger. Now a logger is going to have a handler and the handler is going to have a formatter. And of course, loggers can have multiple handlers. So we need to define the handler and we need to define the formatter that we're going to use. So this is what it is. So we have a section here for formatters. And then you just give a formatter some name. You can choose whatever you want. Here I'll just, I just called it simple. I am going to set the style to using this bracket notation. I prefer that over the percentage. I think the percentage is a little faster than using the bracket. I haven't checked that out because really that would be premature optimization. In all my applications, my logging is certainly not the bottleneck for anything that I write. So I really don't care if it's marginally faster to use the percentage sign, I just prefer using this way of interpolating in strings. So then we have the format and the format should just be a string where you specify certain fields inside those curly braces. Now, where do those fields come from? Well, I had remember a link in here where you have some different documentation. So let's actually go and look at that. And let's take a look at the formatter objects. And if we scroll down, actually, let's look at the log record objects. I know it's in the, it's closer to that. The log record attributes. There we go. So log record attributes. You can see that there are a number of pre-built fields that are available on the log record. ASC time, ASCII time. I don't know if this is the way to pronounce it, but ASCII time is a human readable time of when the log record was created. So that's useful to have in our log records, but you have all kinds of other information as well. You have like the level, you know, was this a warning? Was this a debug? Was this an error? And so on. You can also have the level number as just a numeric value. This level name obviously is gonna be the name. 
and you can add other things in there. You have the message, which obviously we probably want to include in our log record, but you can include things like the line numbers, so the source line number where the logging call was issued. It might be useful to know that when you're looking at your logs to know exactly which place in your code generated that log record. It can maybe help you track things down. We have milliseconds as well, which is the millisecond portion of the time when the log record was created. We'll come back to that. There's a reason that it's there, and that's because the actual time that you get on the log record doesn't include the milliseconds. So the log record actually splits the, time, the, the date time into two fields, right? And we'll, we'll take a look at that later. And then you have other things as well. You might have the name of the logger that was used to log the call. As, as I mentioned in the previous video, we're going to name our loggers. So it's probably important to add the name of the logger to know, well, which logger actually generated this particular output. But you can also add things like the module, for example, the name of the module, you have the path of the module. And of course, all this is where the log record was you know, created, how, where it was essentially sent to the logging. And then you have things like the stack information, which is useful when you have exceptions. And I'll show you that when we look at structured logging. And then you can have things like thread, the thread name, task, if you have a task name, things like that. Okay, so that's the documentation. So let's go switch back to the code and let's take a look at our config again. So here is the formatter. I specified the ASCII time, the name, remember the name, the level name and message. So remember that those fields came from that table that I mentioned. So what was the name? Well, if we go back and look at name, that is the name of the logger. Okay, so keep that in mind. So this is what our log record, when it gets emitted, how it's going to format those fields. We can add this, you know, we can add a lot more fields if we want to. We can change completely what this string output is going to look like. So now that we have the formatter, let's go ahead and define handlers. Now again, we can define one or more handlers. Same thing, you can, you, can, you can define multiple formatters here, but we're only going to have a single handler, so I don't need more formatters. We can only attach one formatter to a handler, and I'm only going to define one handler that I'm going to attach to the logger. So how do we set up the handler? Well, again, you've got to give it a name and you can choose whatever you want. Here I chose to call it console because that's exactly what it's going to do. It's going to use the Python built-in stream handler. The formatter is going to be the simple formatter that I specified over here. And then one extra parameter that you can specify for stream handler is the stream itself. By default, it will go to standard error. Here, I'm going to actually push it out to standard out. Here in my case, it doesn't really make a difference. Everything's going to my console. But of course, you can pipe streams to different locations. So I'm going to set it up this way. Now, where does this stream handler come from? Well, again, let's turn our attention back to the documentation. And we're going to look at the handlers. And again, the link is in the Git repo in the readme. So there are a bunch of handlers, as I mentioned in the previous video. And the one that we're going to look at right now is called stream handler, right? So if we look at the stream handler, you can see it has a single parameter called stream. That's the parameter that I defined in that configuration dictionary in that YAML file, right? And as, as I mentioned, if you don't specify it, then it will go to standard error by default. All right, so that's how we configure our handler and the formatter. Now we need to configure our loggers. So we're going to create two loggers. Well, the root logger always exists. So we're going to configure the root logger. We're going to set its level to debug and we're going to attach a single handler. So this could be a list with multiple handlers. Here we only have one. We're going to send the, the log record essentially to be handled by the console handler. And then we're going to create another logger called app. So that's the name of the logger app. Its level is going to be info, but I'm not attaching any handlers. So if you remember from the previous video, this means that if the app logger receives a log record that it needs to process, it will do so. It will apply any filters, if any. Right now, the only filter that I have is info. And then it's going to send it up 
to the root logger. And the root logger is therefore going to you know, use its console handler to output the data to the console. So that's how we configure the logging here. So now let's see how we actually use it. So the first thing is I'm going to essentially create my app logger. I'm going to call get logger with app as the name. And then I'm going to create a function called configure loggers. And all I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to open my config file, the one we just looked at, load it. And then that's going to be our config dictionary. And then you just use the dict config. So you go to logging, which we imported, dot config, dot dict config, and you pass in your dictionary. So this is a regular Python dictionary, which is why I said that you can set up your configuration in YAML, in JSON, in a Python dictionary, however you want. You just need to bring it back as a Python dictionary somehow and then send that to the dict config. And then our main is really just going to use the logger. So I created my app logger as a global variable and I can access it in any function in my module. So I'll, we'll do a debug, an info, and a warning. Now remember that we set up, let me do this, those side by side. So remember that we set up our app logger to be info. So we're sending to the app logger here. So debug isn't higher than info. So we don't expect debug to show up in our console. We do expect info to show up and we do expect warning to show up. All right, so then when we run this module, we're going to say configure loggers and then we're going to call main. So let's go ahead and actually run this. And so there you go. We get our info and warning messages in our console. We get our log records. And you can see that string essentially came from here. Simple formatter. There it is, simple formatter. Then we have that time, that date time, including the milliseconds. We have the logger name, was called app. Then we have the level name. And then we have the actual message itself. So this could actually be everything you need for implementing logging in your application. You've got a relatively simple application. You don't need anything fancy. You need to output to the console. There you go. That's it. That's all you need. So as you can see, it's very, very simple. And in fact, Python logging is actually quite simple, but then you can start building things more complex, right? And this is where things sometimes get a little confusing. Now in that next example, we're going to do the same thing that we have here, but we are going to use code to configure things. We're not going to use that dictionary approach. I just want to show you that this is not something I use very frequently, but if you do need to, or if you run into code that does it this way, you know, you'll understand what's going on. So we're going to create a function called configure loggers and configure logger is going to essentially create or get two loggers. It's going to get the root logger, which always exists. And then it's going to create app logger. It doesn't exist at this point, so it's going to create it and return it. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to print the memory address, the ID of this app logger. And the reason I do that is because I'm going to call a second function later where I also call get logger dot app, you know, get logger with the app as the name. And I'm also going to print out the ID of that logger object. What I'm going to show you here is that the logger object is a singleton object. So no matter where in your code you call logging get logger app, you will always get the same object back. There is no overhead to creating multiple instances of this app logger, right? So you do not need to pass this app logger around. I've seen people do that because they, you know, don't understand that loggers are singleton objects. And again, I explained that in more detail in the previous video. Okay, so then what are we going to do? Well, we're going to create a stream handler, right? So now we're actually going to use the stream handler class. I showed you that in the documentation. We know that it takes a stream argument and we're going to specify the system standard out as the stream argument. Then we need to create our simple formatter. Well, we're going to use the formatter class that's in the logging library. 
we're going to specify our format string and then I'm going to specify style to be the braces because I'm using braces here, not the percentage sign thing. Now we need to assign our formatter to the handler. Well, we take the stream handler and we use the set formatter method and we pass it simple formatter. By the way, if you're asking yourself why are these things, you know, not using kind of the more the Python norm with uh, snake case, um, why? Well, it's because this logging library, the person who wrote it was essentially very much inspired by log4j, which is a Java library. So he kind of kept things similar, I guess, to log4j. I don't have any experience with log4j, so I don't know if it has the same kind of structure and the same kind of methods or not. So, you know, if, if you know that, I'd be interested in knowing, just leave a comment and let us know if this is kind of how log4j works as well. All right, so we're going to set the formatter on the stream handler. Now we need to add the stream handler to the logger and we add it to the root logger. So we're going to use the add handler and pass it stream handler. Then we also want to set the level for the root logger. And remember, we had set it to debug. So we'll set it to debug. And then for our application logger, we're going to set the level to info. In our main method, we're going to get this logger app. We're going to print out, as I mentioned, the memory, the, the ID of that uh, object. And then we're going to send three log messages, a debug, info, and warning. And then when we run this, we're going to configure the loggers, and then we're going to call main. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. And as you can see, the app logger ID, the one that I got from the get logger in here, right, has this value. And the ID from the main method has the exact same value. It's a singleton object. No matter which module I'm in in this application, when I call get you know, get logger app, I will always get the same ID. Now, of course, the ID will change every time you restart the app. But while the app is running, the application logger is a singleton and all loggers are singletons. And then you can see we get the same output as before, like so. OK, so this is two ways of configuring your loggers. So let's go back to example number two. And what I want to do here is just tweak things a little bit. I'm going to change the app logger level to debug, right? Remember when we ran this, let's go ahead and run it again, right? We get our info and warning messages from the app logger, all right? So now I'm going to change the app level, so the app logger level from info to debug. I'm going to lower that. So now both the root logger and the app logger are set to debug level. So if we run this, you'll notice that now we get our debug information here, okay? Now, what I mentioned in the previous video is that once a logger has handled a log record, so it hasn't rejected it either from a filter or from the log level, once it does that, it sends it up the chain of loggers. In this case, it's gonna send it up to the root logger. Now, I'm going to change the root logger to let's say warning. And one thing that's very un important to understand is that because the log was actually handled by the app logger, when it goes to the root, the root is not going to apply any filters. It is just going to handle it. So it will not apply any filters. So even though the root well, uh, logger is at warning, and when we send a debug message, it's going to go through the app and it is still going to get logged to the console. Let's see that. And you can see that we get our debug. And that's because this is the app logger that is essentially logging this record. It doesn't have any handlers, so it's going to rely on the root or at least a higher, you know, um, logger in the logger hierarchy to handle the actual log record. So finally, let's do one more tweak. We're going to change the app logger to disable propagation. We're going to do that by specifying propagate and we could specify false or no or zero and so on. So propagate. Okay. So now we're no longer going to propagate. So app is going to receive a call to log something, but propagation is turned off. App doesn't have a handler. So what's going to happen? 
Well, remember that last resort handler we talked about? Python logging is going to use that because propagation is not turned on so there are and there are no handlers, so it uses that last resort approach. So let's see what we get when we run this. So remember, right now, this is what we see, simple formatter, the date, time, etc., the message. If we run it now, now we only see the warning message. Why is that? Well, this is kind of an idiosyncrasy here. It's using this last result handler, and that last result handler is set to warning level. So you're only going to see warnings and higher. So all the other code, the debug and the info, isn't going to show. All right. So you just have to be aware of that, that if you don't have propagation and your logger doesn't have any handlers, things are just going to be basically warnings and it's going to output just the message to the console. Right. So if you start seeing things like this in your application, know that you just haven't configured things correctly. You need to go back and double check. All right. So that was example two and three. Now let's move on to example number four. So in this example, we're going to essentially set up a file handler, just a simple file handler. Now note that this file handler is just going to keep growing the log file over time. So you're going to need to establish some process to purge it yourself unless you change the mode. And let's just see what's going on here. So first of all, remember that we have a file handler that's available to us. If we go back to the handlers, here's the file handler, right? And it has a few parameters that we can specify. Some of them are defaulted, some of them are not. So file name is required. You need to tell the file handler which file to send the log records to, to write the log records out to. You also have the mode. By default, the mode is A, which is append, which means that every time your application runs, it will just keep appending to the same file. You can also set your mode to W. When you do that, it's going to recreate your log file every time. So there, you're not going to have unlimited growth. It will grow for as long as your application is running, but it's still going to grow. But every time you restart your app, your log record will essentially get recreated. So you typically don't use the file handler that much because it can create problems, right? If, you, if you're not taking care of it and handling it, then you can get to a situation where you run out of disk space and then everything comes crashing down, right? So, and I've seen that happen multiple times. So instead, we want to use a rotating file handler, but I'll show you that in a future example. So let's go back to the code and let's see how we're going to set this up. So first of all, I created a logs directory, which is empty. And let me make that bigger. So let's see what we have. Well, the formatter, I'm going to use the same one that we had before. I've just called it file formatter, right? I've uh, added function name in there. But as I said, you can make that whatever you want. For the handlers, I've created a simple file handler and it's going to use the logging file handler. Basically here, you're specifying in text how you would you know, reference that file handler class. Well, the file handler class is in the logging module. Not all built-in handlers are directly in the logging module. Some of them are under logging.handlers or .handler, um, .handlers, .whatever. We'll, we'll see those. But file handler, stream handler are so common that they're in the, you know, in, in the root logging library. We need to give it the file name. So here we go. We, we specify the parameter name and we give it the file name. So I'm going to log. So this is a relative path. It's going to go to logs, example 4.log. So it should end up in this directory here that's highlighted on the left. And the mode is going to be append. And then for the loggers, we're going to create two loggers. Well, we're not going to create the root logger, as I mentioned. That's always created by default. We are going to configure it. So we're going to set its level to debug. We're going to specify the file handler as a handler on the root logger. And then we're going to create, or, or not create, this is really just going to give us the configuration for our app logger. We have to create the logger itself in code. This is just configuration. And the only thing I'm going to do here is just set its level to info. So this is very similar to what we had before. So now if we look at our main code, I'm going to get the logger. So I'm using a you know, global variable. I'm going to get the app logger. This creates the app logger, right? But as of now, it's not configured. 
it's just been created with its whatever the defaults were. Then in, when I run this code, the first thing I have to do is configure the loggers. So I'm going to again just write this as a function, same as before, right? Just load the YAML file, pass it to dict config. We're done. Now here we're going to do an error log and an info log. And if you're going to use interpolation, then you have to use the old style here. You can't use the braces. Now you could use an F string and interpolate things right away. But as I mentioned in the previous video, you typically don't want to do that because if the logger rejects, right? So this is an error. It will actually be handled by the app logger. But if the app logger, if this was a debug, for example, the app logger is going to reject it, right? Because it's set to info. And therefore, it's not even going to try to do this interpolation. So you've saved a little bit of cycles. It's really not a huge deal, but it is considered best practice. All right, so when we run the code, we're going to configure the loggers and run main. So let's see what happens. Let me go ahead and delete that file. I'd run it just before doing this uh, cut in the video. So let me go ahead and run this. Now we get no output on the console, which is expected because our logging is going to file. That's the only handler that we have. It's a file handler. And indeed, you can see the example for log file got created and we see our log records. We have error. We have that it was in the main. So this was a the, the main. Why do I have main twice? What did I do in here? I've got the module and the function name. OK, that's why. So I've got the module and the function name, main and main. And then we have the interpolated string, right? So the logger did the interpolation for us because it realized that I need to emit this log to the file, so I need to do the interpolation. OK, so let's move on to the next example. I'm going to put those side by side. Well, actually, let's look at the logger config first. So in this example, we're going to set up a rotating file handler. And we'll do a sized-based handler with a ridiculously small size in order to see the rotation actually happen quickly. So how do we do this? Well, again, if you go back to the documentation for the rotating file handler, let's take a look at it. So the rotating file handler, you'll notice that the rotating file handler is in the logging.handlers module, not directly in the logging. That's why I was saying earlier, you have to be careful as to where those handlers are, right? But that's where it is. So you can see that for the formatter, I'm keeping the same thing as before. For the loggers, I'm kind of doing the same thing as before. The only difference is that I'm attaching a handler that I've named rotating file to the root logger. So I'm just following the same pattern that we've seen so far. And here, I'm going to specify my, my, uh, my handler to be the rotating file handler. And since it's in the logging handlers module, I need to specify it this way here. I am going to send it off to this logs folder. Let me go ahead and just delete my old logs. And then I'm going to set the maximum size in bytes of those log files. I'm going to set it to a thousand and I'm going to set up a backup count of three. So basically what this does, it's going to, as soon as the log file reaches a thousand, it's going to switch and create a new log file. And then it's going to keep three files, right? So we'll, we'll see that, but that's the backup count. So eventually over time, as you get more and more new logging files, it's going to push out the old ones. This guarantees that your logs are not going to make you run out of space on your hard drive. Okay, so that's the configuration. That's really all there is to it. So if we look at the main code, well, it's kind of the same. There is no difference. We configure the loggers, same as before. Right, we get the app logger here at the, as a module level global variable. We configure the loggers by passing it that dictionary. And then here the main is different though. I'm going to create a hundred log records. And that's because I want to, you know, start going over that, that limit that we had, that 1000 bytes limit. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. And so when we do this, you can see that we have the app log. Right, so look at the time, 9.37.04. And if we look at app log one, oh, okay, I need to, because I didn't put, so 8.04.800. So this is actually the most recent one. 
And then we have one, which is 799 at 800. So that's the previous one. And then we have the one from before and the one from before. And then all the other ones have fallen off. You don't see an app log four. That's because we didn't set that. If we had set that configuration to back up four, right? And let me go ahead and delete all this stuff. So we start fresh. If I had done this, you would see we have we would have four backups, right? The current one plus the four backups. And basically it pushes things down. As the as this one fills up, it will push it down to one. One will get pushed down to two, two to three, three to four, and four is gonna fall off. So that's the rotating file handler. And if you're gonna to log to file, this is probably the one you should use over using just the plain file handler since you could run out of disk space but kind of depends on your situation and what you want to do in particular. All right, moving on to the next example. So in this example, we're going to set up a system to log all our logs to a rotating file. But we're also going to set things up so that warning and higher logs will also log to the console. So I want to send my log records to two different locations. One is I want to send everything to the file. And then for warning and higher, I want to put that on the console. I'm, you know, I really want the console to show me that. I don't want the console to show me debug info, right? But I want to see warning, errors, exceptions, and so on on the console as well. Now, while we're at it, I'm also going to use a file formatter to emit JSON strings. I'll use the printf syntax just to show how that works, this percentage sign, right? But as we're going to see in this example, this approach to generating JSON is only partially adequate. Things go off the rails when we have log exceptions. So if you're emitting JSON this way, don't log exceptions because the exceptions by default have a stack trace and that's going to get interspersed with the JSON. And that's not what we want. Now we'll come back to this and I'll show you how to fix that and how to do it properly. But here I just wanted to start showing you that you don't really need anything fancy to start you know, generating structured logs. All right, so what are we doing here? Well, we're going to create two handlers and two formatters. I need a, for, a formatter for my file formatter. And the reason I have another one is because for the console, I want something different. So here's what I have. So for the file formatter, I'm using the percentage style. So I don't need to specify the style, that's the default. What do I have in here? I have, you know, basically a string. This is just a string, but it's made to look like it contains JSON, right? It looks like a JSON string. We have time, the ASCII time, the logger, the name of the logger, the level, the level name, message, and the message. For my console formatter, I'm going to use the braces and I'm going to basically output this. So when I have logs to the console, this is the format I'll see. I don't want to see JSON on the console. It's more difficult to read. I want to see a plain string. But for my file, I want to ingest that somewhere that can handle JSON. So I want JSON looking like, you know, JSON-like strings. So now, since we want to log to these two different places, we're going to need two handlers. We need one for the file and one for the console. So this is just as before. We're going to create a handler, call it whatever you want. We're going to call it rotating file. And we specify the logging handlers, rotating file handler. The formatter is the file formatter. The file name, where it's going to go to, the maximum number of bytes and the backup count. We've seen this. For the console, again, we're going to use the stream handler. We're going to use the console formatter that I define here. Nothing new. We've done this before. So let's start simple first. So now you'll notice that I've set the level on the console, right? So I've set the level at the handler. Remember that you can set your level either at the logger, which applies to all handlers, or the individual handler. And that's what I want because I only want to send warnings and above to the console. But everything else based on the, you know, if it actually gets handled by the hand by the logger will go to the file. So my root logger has a level of debug and it has two handlers. It has the rotating file handler and the console. And my app is going to be an info. So info and higher. So warning is going to go through, right? Info, warning, error, exception, all these are going to go through the app. It's going to reach root. The root is going to send it to both handlers. 
the rotating file handler, the rotating file handler doesn't have any further um, filters, so it's going to write it out to the file. The console, however, has a level of warning, so it will filter out anything that's warning, that's below warning. All right, so if we look at our main class, nothing really changed in terms of how we set up the logging, right? We just basically do our uh, get or create our app logger. We configure it using configure loggers that gets called here when we run this script. And then on the main, I'm going to do an info with an info message. I'm going to sleep a little bit just so we give it time. Then I'm going to you know, log an error level message. We're going to sleep again. And then I also want to log an exception. And I want to do an exception because I want you to see how it affects the logs and why I said that doing, you know, this approach to doing JSON structured logging isn't quite right. There's something that's a little bit off. So we'll take, we'll come back to it though and fix that. So let's go ahead and run this. And when we run this, this is what we get. So you'll notice that we get our two logs over here from the app logger, the error. Right, so this was just the console, and remember we were logging warnings and above, that's why it shows up in the console. You'll notice also that because we had an exception, we also got the trace back because we used the logger.exception, which will actually emit the exception, you know, information or details about the exception that occurred. Now that's fine having that in the console output. However, if we go ahead and look at the log file, this one, you'll notice that we have our kind of our JSON output, right, for the info, which was just that regular info that we sent, and then we also have the two errors, but look at the traceback information, and that kind of breaks our structured logs, right, so it's no longer now just lines that contain JSON strings, JSON documents, now we have some stuff that is not JSON intermixed with that as well. And so that's why I was saying that this isn't exactly the final solution yet for setting up structured logging. So we'll come back to that in a later example. So let's move on to the next example. And in this one, we're going to customize the date time output in our logs. That's something that we often want to do. Now, by default, the logging system uses the local time. And usually servers are configured to use UTC, so that's usually not an issue. But if it's not, your local system, for example, probably isn't set up to be emitting logs with UTC times. So we'll want to somehow ensure that no matter what the local time zone is of the machine, the log records are always going to be in UTC. And additionally, I'm also going to show you how we can change the serialization format to something other than the default that's provided. Now, one way to do this is to specify this globally in the logging library. And for doing that, we use the logging formatter converter attribute. Now, we can set it using the gm time function that's in the time module. Remember, the gm time is going to give us essentially UTC time. And we could do this using pure configuration. But I'm not going to do this because I also want to customize the format string and that I can't do via the configuration. So let's take a look. So I'm going to take my logging, right? My, my, this is now setting up, remember, at the library level. So I'm going to take the logging library and I'm going to use the formatter and I'll specify this converter property and set it to the GM time. And my default format is going to be this string over here. So it's going to be year, month, day, and then the T, and then hour, minutes, and second. Now we have to be a little bit careful. The time converters like local time or GM time, which is the one we're using here, do not provide fractional seconds. The logging library gets around this problem by actually defining two format strings. One for the date time at a second's resolution, which is this one over here, GM time in this, the time format, and a second format string just for the milliseconds, which is this one over here, the default millisecond format. So we can override both of those strings at the library level, so it will apply to everything we use then within the library from that point forward. 
Now, there are other ways of doing this, but this is probably the simplest way to do it that I'm aware of. If you know of a simpler or just as simple way of doing it, please let us know in the comments. So, of course, again, you know, just to reiterate, this method affects all the formatters, which is usually what we want. But if you do need to have different formatters with different time formats, you're going to have to do something more complicated. And usually it gets into creating a custom formatter subclass and then using that. So the, the way that this is going to get put together is that the actual time string that gets output is going to be this concatenated with this. So I want the time zone information on here. I don't want to put it here because I would have Z right before the my you know milliseconds. So instead, I'm going to put the Z here. And I'm hard coding the Z because I know that I'm in UTC, right? So that's why I can hard code that value there. And then everything else is kind of the same. If we look, we have our formatter simple. We're using the ASC time. So again, we're using that built-in uh, date time string that the logger is going to provide us, but we've configured it over here so that it's going to use this more custom formatting. Then we have our handler. We have a handler for console, which is going to do a stream handler to stand it out. And then we set up our app level to debug. We attach the console handler to the root logger and off we go. So now if we run this, then you'll see that we now have this custom date time that we wanted. Okay, so this is a very simple way of achieving this result. Okay, moving on. In the next example, we're going to look at how we can use that extras. If you remember from the previous video, I mentioned that we can pass in extra information that will then get included in the log record. And then we can have our formatters or handlers or whatever, wherever we want to use this, actually use this extra information. Okay, so how am I using this? Well, the configuration is the same as before. There's nothing funky there. Here, you'll notice when I'm doing the log, I am sending in this extra argument over here. It's a named argument, extra, and it's just a dictionary of key value pairs. Those key value pairs will show up in the log record, and therefore we can access them. So now when we look at the logger config, you'll notice that I have a format with now I'm accessing arg1 and arg2. That's exactly the name that I've specified here. If I specified, you know, field XYZ, then here I would have to use field XYZ as well. Now, one thing to note is that because of the way I've done it here, using the format string and using, you know, a standard handler and a standard formatter, just setting the format string, we have to have arg1 available. Otherwise, it's going to cause issues, right? So that extra dictionary must always contain those keys that we're using here. This isn't ideal. This might be fine. In many cases, it is. But there are ways that we can work around that. And I'll come back to that later and show you how we can get around the fact that we may not always have the same arguments in the extra. Okay? So for now, this is just a simplified way of doing it. And that's really all there is to it. So now we can go ahead and run this. And you'll see that our logs have this arg1, which was 100 and test1 and 200 and test2. Okay, So that's how we can use this and leverage this extra by using the simple string formatter and then specifying a custom format that accesses the values on the log record. But again, that means the values must be present. If we don't have them present, if we do something like this, for example, you'll see what happens. Let's run this. And you can see that we get an exception. Okay, so we had an exception. Our code still continues running because exceptions in the logging module don't stop your code from continuing to run, but it is going to essentially output all this stuff, right, to the console or to the, well, actually to the console. And if that's where we're logging things, then it's going to be interspersed with our actual logs. And that's maybe not, you know, something that we want. So we want to try and avoid this issue. So let's look at our next example. And our next example is essentially going to be how to set up a custom filter. So let's look at 
how we define a custom filter. And basically, a filter is going to be a callable that's going to receive the log record, and then it's going to compute something using the values on the log record, and essentially emit a true or a false as a return value, true indicating, yes, please go ahead and include this in the log, or false, skip this, don't process this in the logs. Okay, so essentially our callable needs to return true or false. It's going to be a predicate function. Now the way we set it up is we create a custom class and we inherit from the filter class that's in the logging module. Now we're going to do an init and in the init it's going to receive two parameters, the arg name and the arg threshold. Arg name is going to be and I could hard code this in here, but I don't want to do that. I want to show you how we can actually use configuration to specify those things. Because what am I looking for? Well, if we look at the filter function, it's going to receive the log record. This is a function that exists in the filter class. You have to override it. And here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for this arg name on the record. So arg name is the name of the argument that's going to be in the extra dictionary that's then going to become an attribute on the class right so here i'm passing in my arg so the arg name is going to be my arg so i could do you know i could hard code this and say if self dot my arg exists first of all and and if self dot my arg is greater than self dot arg threshold whatever that threshold is maybe i hard coded here to you know 100 then return true, otherwise return false. So I could hard code those things here, but I don't want to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to let configuration determine what the argument name should be, right? So here it's going to be my arg, so I'll specify that, but in configuration, and also what the threshold should be. And I'm also going to specify that in the configuration. I'm not going to specify that or hard code that here or in my module. It just lets this thing be a little bit more flexible. So the init is going to get from somewhere. We'll see where it comes from in a second. It's going to get the argument name. So what's the attribute that we're looking for, right? Well, I could have called it adder name maybe rather than arg name. But the attribute name, that's going to be on the log record and some value that I'm calling threshold. And I just store that on the instance of this filter. Now the filter function or the filter method is going to receive the log record and then I do a few checks. Basically I want to see that this value, the value of this attribute is greater than my threshold. So the first thing is I need to make sure that I have a name. So if the name is none then I'm just going to return false. There's nothing here. I'm just going to say nope I'm not going to process this record because it doesn't even have the attribute I'm looking for. I also need to make sure that a threshold was provided. So now I have the argument, I have the threshold. I didn't check that the argument was an integer. I probably should do that as well. But for simplicity, I omitted that here as well. Next, I need to check, okay, so I have a name of the argument. And let's say that somehow we passed in my arg to here. Now I need to know that the log record has that attribute, my arg. So I check that it has the attribute. And then if it does, then I'm going to then check what the value is of that attribute on the log record and make sure that it's greater than the threshold. Okay, so this is kind of a simplified way of checking that. You could probably put a few more lines of code to check other things like make sure the argument threshold is indeed an integer, make sure that the arg name not only exists but is also an integer, that kind of stuff. Okay. And then we just configure our loggers in the usual way. You'll notice that we have no reference to this custom filter in here. All of that is going to be done through the configuration file. And then we have just three log messages. One where we don't specify the extra dictionary at all. And two where we specify the extra dictionary. And then both of them contain this key my arg. Now it could be that, you know, one of those extras doesn't contain my arg. That's fine. It'll just return false in the filter. Okay, so now let's look at the configuration and let's look at it side by side. So remember that we have this arg name and arg threshold. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually define the filter 
in our configuration. So for that, we use the filters section, and then I'm going to call this whatever I want. Here, I'm just going to call it my filter. Now, in order to define what the filter is, it is going to be a callable. And this is just kind of the syntax that the logging module uses. In order to indicate that this parameter here is a callable, we just enclose, you know, we, we use these parentheses and we enclose that in a string, obviously, since that's not a valid name. But to the logging system, it tells it this is a callable. You're going to have to call this. So it knows that this is the, you know, the implementation of the filter. Now we have two other arguments that we're specifying. Now remember, in the custom filter, we have two arguments, arg name and arg threshold. Well, here they are here, arg name and arg threshold. You'll notice that as the value for arg name, I specify my arg. In other words, based on the code that I implemented here in the filter, this is the attribute that I'm looking for on the log record. I'm going to look for the attribute called my arg. And then the arg threshold, I'm just passing in hard-coded here as a value of 100. So my arg threshold is going to be 100 when this custom filter runs, because those are going to be injected essentially in the init, right? So essentially, that's all this by filter does. It specifies which filter are you using, and this is just basically a path, right? A package path to the filter. Here it was in my main module, so I need to reference it this way, main.customfilter. If you have it in other places in your code, you just basically give it the, you know, the import path, the package path to that. And then we have the arg name, my arg arg threshold. Okay. So then let's take a look at the handlers. So I've got two handlers. I've got a console handler, which is going to use the simple formatter, which is this one over here. So it just has this format. And then I have another handler called special. I set the level to warning. So I only want to push out warning and higher. The formatter is special, and it's really the same as the simple formatter. The only difference is that I added this string in front, and that's just so that in the console, when we see the output, we can easily differentiate which handler actually output the log record in the console. But otherwise, the rest of the information is the same. And then we have our class stream handler standard out, same as before, and I attached my filter to the handler. Now, of course, you could also attach filters to your loggers, but here I want to attach it to the special handler because I want to filter only on the special handler. And then we have our loggers, right? We've got our root and our app. Our root is now going to have two handlers, console and special. Okay, so that's, that's it. So this is how we set up or create or define the custom filter. And this is how we configure it. We have to tell the, app, the the logging application, the logging system, what is the class we're using? Well, it's this one over here. And if we have arguments in the init that we've implemented, we don't have to implement an init, and then you don't have to specify anything here. Then it will pass those values to the init. And this is what I was saying about not hard coding those values in the code itself. Instead, this is more flexible. I can change by using the configuration file, I can change the name that I'm expecting in the dictionary. Here I'm expecting my arg, so I specified my arg, but if I want it to be something else, I just change it to whatever it should be. And then the same thing with the threshold, I can you know change my threshold here. And so I could do this differently based on whether it's a production system or a development system, you know, an environment and so on. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this. So let's run main. And let's see what we get. So as you can see, we get our three standard console logs over here, right? From our, st our standard console handler, which uses the simple formatter. But then we also have one that shows up for the special handling. Now, if we go back and look at what they were, well, extra here was had my arc set to 200. 200 is greater than 100, so it should show up. And indeed it does. Right, we see this log record here that was handled by our second handler. On the other hand, here my arg was 50, that is not greater than 100, therefore it doesn't show up. And then this one didn't even have the key my arg, so it doesn't show up with the special handling either. 
Okay, so that's how you can set up custom filters. Very, very straightforward and quite easy to do. Okay, moving on to the next example. This one, we're going to look at how to create a custom formatter this time. So we're going to go back to our previous JSON formatter, but this time we're going to make it a little bit more complex and give it the ability to handle exceptions properly. Remember, that was the problem we had last time. When we had exceptions, everything still worked, but the JSON output was getting, you know, polluted essentially with these lines with the stack trace in there. Now note that you do have third-party libraries that will do structured logging and so on. But here I want to look at how to do it using first principles, basically using the standard libraries logging implementation. And if you're interested, I can do videos on some of these other logging systems. The two in particular that I'm thinking of is LogGuru and StructLog. These are the two that I've used in the past that I find are quite nice to use as well. So this approach here is something that I use actually quite often because often I don't need the complexity of these other third-party libraries. I just need something that I can do quickly, you know, without having to have extra dependencies on my project. I know that this is now my soapbox moment, but having extra dependencies in a project, it causes headaches. It, it does for multiple reasons. One is, well, you need to be sure that the library you're using doesn't have malicious code in it. Maybe it doesn't now, maybe it will later. So you need to keep you know, an eye on that. You need to make sure you keep things updated. There might be issues in the library that you're using that might be security issues and you therefore have to keep you know, your, your versions up to date. It also adds extra dependencies. There's more things to be installed when you're uh, you know, running that, when you're going to deploy that in some system somewhere. So there's a lot of reasons why I personally try and avoid bringing in libraries that I don't need. For example, you know, logging is, could be very well one of them. Another one might be pandas. Some people I've seen import pandas and that is a huge library with a lot of ramifications to it simply because they need to load up an ex, you know, a CSV file into an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Well, you don't need pandas for that, right? You're bringing in uh, uh, the kitchen sink when you really don't need it. And again, for the same reasons, right? Now you have to maintain it. You have to keep it updated. You have to make sure there's no malicious code and so on and so on and so on. So this is why I'm showing you this here, how to do the structured logging without resorting to other libraries. Okay, now I can climb off my soapbox. So let's take a look at uh, a couple of things. So one is we're going to define a formatter. Now, remember how we defined the filter? We just inherited from the logging filter. Here, we're going to inherit from the logging formatter. Now, the format is simply going to receive the log record, and it should output, well, whatever it is you want to send out. Now, here, I'm outputting a string, which is fine, but a string can contain whatever we want. In particular, it can contain something that looks like JSON, because JSON is strings, right? JSON objects are strings. So here I'm just gathering whatever I want essentially from the log record. So I'm going to grab the time. I'll get back to this serialized local timestamp in a sec. Then I've got the logger name, the level name, grabbing all of those things, as you can see, from the record to get the message. Remember that in the message, we also have possible interpolation that can happen. And remember that I said that we should leave the interpolation to the logging because it will be done only if the log gets emitted. So here, now we have to do the actual interpolation and we simply use the, mess the function called getMessage, right? Or the method called getMessage that's on the record. We can grab the module name, we can grab the file name, the path name, the function name, and then we can also now put in the exception info. So if the record has an exception info, then we can use format exception that is on the, that is provided in the formatter class, but we're inheriting from the formatter class. So our object has this method now called format exception, and we pass it the exception info that's on the record itself. But we only do this if it actually has a value. Otherwise, we just set exception info to none. And then we do the same thing with the stack trace. If our record has a stack info, then we call the format stack function 
that's basically going to create a nice string out of the stack info and we're going to assign that as the value for stack traits otherwise it will be none and then lastly we just basically take our dictionary and dump that out to a JSON string now if you're using more complicated objects custom objects and so on then of course you're gonna to have to worry about how you're serializing to JSON you may have to write a custom JSON serializer all that kind of stuff but that has nothing to do with logging right so this is all the format record does the format method does it basically receives the log record and it returns an object here I'm just returning a string straightforward right okay let's take a look at this serialize local timestamp so we have this created value this created attribute on the record and basically that's local time I want to get that into UTC and I'm not going to worry about the seconds here remember that the, the milliseconds remember that trick I showed you you have to use another property on the record for the milliseconds I'm not going to worry about it here you should know how to do that at this point since we've looked at that already so all I'm doing here is I'm basically converting my timestamp which is local to UTC and then I'm formatting it in this special way over here okay and that's it so that is the JSON formatter custom formatter now let's take a look at the rest of the code how do we configure things well as you can see this is the same as before there is nothing that I have to do specifically here in the code to use the JSON formatter all of that is going to be in the config just like we did with the filter and then for the main you can see we log in info message one we log info message two and we're going to do an interpolation here right and then the third one is going to use this extra dictionary where I'm passing it the keys a b and c could be anything else right so here I'm just used those ones and then I also want to generate an exception so I'm going to artificially raise a value error and then log the exception and let's see if we get the same issue where we had those you know text lines essentially getting interspersed without JSON strings okay so let's look at the config so for the config we specify the formatter and again the formatter is a callable so under the formatters we specify some name whatever we want right I just happen to call it JSON here and then I'm indicating to the log library that it's a callable and this is the name of the class and this is where it's located right so this is essentially like the import path now for the handlers I only have a single handler it's going to essentially log to this uh, to a stream so it's going to be a console standard out and it's going to use the JSON formatter and then for the loggers I have my app level info and then at the root I attach the console handler so when we go back and if we run this then you'll see that everything now is nicely formatted we get our proper JSON and when we have an exception you'll notice that we get our trace back exception info right is now an actual JSON property and the same thing should happen with the stack info that gave me something else so let's grab this and let me go ahead and put that into a text editor and I'm going to format it as JSON all right so as you can see now we have a proper JSON document we've got the time the login name all that stuff we've got our exception info and we have our stack trace as well right but as you can see it is now no longer just lines in the middle of our JSON it is actually part of the JSON itself so all of this is a proper JSON string okay so this is how we can create a custom formatter and obviously here I'm outputting a string but I could be outputting something else and as I discussed in the previous video that object then could get sent somewhere else we need to write you know maybe a custom handler uh, and so on all right let's move on to the next example and let me just clear out the logs so we can start fresh there we go okay so in this example what I want to actually just talk about a little bit more is what happens to our application when an exception occurs during logging we saw earlier when I showed you that it will actually spit out some information to the console 
Now, as we are developing our application, it's fine for that to happen, right? We definitely want to be aware of the issues with our logging code. But when we move to production, we probably don't want an exception in our logging to affect the application itself. Now, we can tell the logging library to suppress these exceptions, and we can let our app continue running uninterrupted by setting a flag at the library level called raise exceptions. Now, unfortunately, this flag doesn't seem to be supported in the dict config. So we have to do this in code. So we'd probably want to use an, envir you know, an environment variable in order to easily set it differently in various environments. Now, the app will continue running in both cases, right? An exception in the logging is not going to stop your app from running. And I've mentioned that before. But in the latter case, when we set this flag, we don't want to see the exception in the console. So we're in, when we're in local development, we probably want to set that flag to true, leave it true, which is the default. But when we move to production, we'll probably want to turn it off so that we're not polluting our logs necessarily with this information. Now, you might still want to leave it on, right? But the problem is that if you're using structured logging and it's going to the console, then you're going to have some things interspersed with the JSON again, which could be an issue. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to call the custom handler code that we did in the last example and just introduce a bug. And we'll see how the application behaves. So if we look at that, this is basically the same code as before. So we've got our JSON formatter. The difference is that I'm going to, when I configure the logger, I'm going to con configure it by calling it from main. And I'm going to set raise exceptions to false or true. So we can start with true, right? So let's raise exceptions. That's the default. So when we run this, there's going to be an exception. Let's go ahead and see what it is. All right. So an exception occurred. Let's look at the whole, you know, trace. So we get our logging error. And it was during this raise value error that we got an exception. And it was in our JSON dump, right? So something happened here that it wasn't able to do. And in fact, the problem was that there was some object that wasn't serializable, that wasn't serializable to JSON. And let's see why that is. It is because I just used record exception info this way. Remember the way that we're supposed to do it to get it into a string. Otherwise, this is some object and the JSON dump doesn't know how to serialize this thing. So it really should be done just to remind you how that should be done. It should be done by calling these this uh, format exception, right? So anyway, that's what the issue was over here. So when we ran this, you'll notice that we get our logs, right? So we did get our uh, info log. And I put the info log after the problem over here. So we had the exception that happened in the logging with the exception logger, but the code continued running just fine. That wasn't an issue and we got our proper info level log. So now let's say I'm moving this to production. I fixed all the problems and I don't want this to happen. So I don't want to see the stack trace over here. Basically, I want to silence it. Silencing isn't always a good option, but in some cases you might want to do it. So now when I rerun this, you can see that basically I silenced the exception that happened with my logger exception, and I still get, just as before, my logger info. All right, so that's that's all that that is. It's a flag, and I do not see a way of setting this flag, this uh, raise exceptions to true or false through the config. If you know of a way to do it in through the config, that's straightforward then please let us know in the comments as well. I'd be interested to hear your viewpoint on it. Okay, so that was example 11. Let's move on to the next one. All right, so let's take a look at kind of the basic code that is in this particular uh, example. So we have some utils. So in the utils, well, let's, let's actually just walk our way through. So the first thing is uh, forgetting about the imports for a second. We've got this configure loggers that I put into the log config module in the configs module. So configure loggers is doing the same thing as before. Okay. And I'm also defining this over here, this inspect logger disabling. 
And I got this from a Stack Overflow post, so take a, go ahead and take a look at that. Basically, this is a way for me to know what code disabled the logger, right? So it, it kind of allows me to trace that. So I can inspect logger disabling. And this is how you would do it. You've got a property, you've got, you know, a getter and setter. And we'll come back to where we use this. So then we've got the logger formatter. Again, we've seen this before. Here I'm going to use a JSON format. And this is going to create a, a problem here. I probably should fix that. Uh, this will be the logs output where we'll have our logs. Let's go ahead and clear them right now. And then we have our services and underneath I've got AWS and I've got this inspect logger that I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But basically I'm creating the logger here, right? I'm creating the services.aws logger. And here all I'm doing is I'm just sending a debug message with some extra information. On the Azure side, I've got the same thing. I'm creating here the logger and I'm going to log an info record. And then for GCP, I'm doing the same thing, except here I'm sending a warning. Okay, so I've got different log levels that I'm using in AWS, Azure, and uh, Google Cloud. Now I've got my utils. So the formatter, well, this is my format date standard, right? So we've seen something like that before. Basically, I want to have this format for my date and time, and I'm going to use that in my configuration for my loggers. Now, I also have something, a utility for the loggers, which is to inspect a logger. So I can pass it a logger. I can see if it's already been configured. So if it is in the logging logger manager, logaddict, then it is, it has been configured and I can get information about it. I can, I know its name, obviously, but I can get its effective level. I can get its handlers and I can also check to see if it's been disabled or not. And then the times is just empty, validators is just empty. I didn't put anything in there. Okay, so we do our configure logger. Then I get my application level logger that, I've, that I'm calling my app and I send an info message, right? So we create the logger here, which is fine because not only is it created after the configuration has happened, but it is also explicitly defined in the configs. We'll take a look at the config in a sec. Now this, this code over here, right? We've imported those modules and we're going to call those three functions. So it will log to services.aws, services.asia and services.gcp loggers. Now those loggers are not explicitly defined in the configs. We'll see that. And then lastly, we're going to log to the utils logger. So I'm going to use the formatters. Remember the formatters is here, formatters actually looks at the utils logger. It gets that and then it uses the utils logger to send some information to. So I'm going to basically call this format date standard and this format date standard does the logger info. Okay. So let's look now at our configuration file. So here I'm starting off by disable existing loggers, setting it to false. And we'll come back and try it and see what happens when we set that to true, which is the default. So we've got two different formatters. We've got a JSON formatter and we've got a simple formatter. For the handlers, we've got our console formatter JSON, which is going to go to the console. So we want JSON to go to the console. And obviously, as I said, there's a mistake in that. We should be using that special way of getting the exception info into the JSON. So go ahead and fix that from you know the previous example that we did with JSON structured logging. Then we have another handler that I called utils handler, and that is going to use the simple formatter and it's going to go to a file and it's going to go to the utils log. And I'm using mode W here, which will recreate the file every time the app starts. Okay. And then we have our loggers and I've only defined explicitly three loggers, the root, which is set up to go to the console, my app, which doesn't have any handlers, set to debug, so it doesn't have any handlers. The propagate is not set to false, so anything I send to my app will propagate to the root. And then I'm also setting up the utils logger explicitly. Again, debug level, I'm specifying which handler I wanted to use. And more importantly, I'm setting up the propagate to false, which means that when I log something to the utils, 
It will use the utils handler, but it will not propagate it back to the root. So I will not get a console output for things that I send to the utils. I will only get it in the utils uh, log file, which is going to show up in the directory called logs over here on the left. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this and let's see what we get. So I left a piece of, I, I left something somewhere that shows us the configuration. All right, I just turned it off so it doesn't mess up what we're seeing here. But let's see what we're getting. So we're getting a log from the my app logger, right? Which is the log that got generated right here. This is a test message, right? So this is this one here. So we got our info level. Then we also see some logs from the services, AWS, Azure, and GCP. And we get debug info warning. Those are the three that we had. What I'm not seeing here is the uh, format, the, the log record from the utils. But we know that's true because it's we were sending it, remember, only to the utils log. And there we go. It's in the utils log over here, right? Okay, so it looks like all the log records were emitted. And we were, remember, configuring after we imported the loggers. But that is because we had this setting over here. Now let's go ahead and set it to true. Or you could just, you know, comment it out because that's the default is set to true. So if we do this, then you'll notice that we get the following. We're running the log configuration. And this was this, remember I was telling you about that inspection that I put in so that we can see what's turning things off. Well, the log configuration is disabling the AWS logger, the Azure logger, and the GCP logger. That's because we created those loggers before we actually configured them and we didn't have them specifically configured anyways in our configuration file. So at the end of the day, the only output that we get here on the console is the my app logger. Because remember that we actually did configure in our um, YAML file. What about the utils? Well, utils is still fine. And let me just, you know, just prove to you. I'll delete that, rerun it, and you'll see the utils log is just fine. Again, we did define, we did configure the utils logger after we had created it, but it was explicitly defined in the logger config. So it gets redefined and re-enabled, if you will. But the other ones, we didn't have explicit, you know, settings for the services loggers, the AWS, Azure, and GCP. And so those got disabled. And so we do not see our, you know, because technically, remember, those loggers are children of the root logger. So the root logger should be handling it, as we saw in the first time we, you know, the first time we ran it. So this is why you have to be careful. So one way of doing that is to make sure that logger get logger gets run before you import those services. So we could do this. We could go ahead and comment this out and we can go ahead and put it here. Okay. So not, not a good thing, right? You don't want to, you know, mess up your imports this way, but I just want to show you that the import order makes a big difference. Now you can see that our logging configuration did not disable AWS, Azure and GCP and we get them back over here. But when we put them at the top, which is where typically we put all our imports, then we run into that issue. So one way of combating that is either, you know, change your import orders, make sure that, you know, for implicit loggers, that you are not creating them before the configuration is run, because the configuration will disable the existing loggers, and it will not re-enable them if they're not in the config. The other way of avoiding that, obviously, is to set this to false, which is what I decided to do here, because I would rather do that in this case than mess up my import order. Okay, and if we go back to that, we get this just as before. All right, so this was a lo another long video on Python logging. I know that some people have asked me to explain the Q logger, and I might do a video on that. I've talked a little bit about what it was
in the first video, but I haven't actually given any, you know, um, time to actually discussing it because that would take a while. Um, but you also have other logging systems like LogGuru and StructLog. So maybe, you know, put in, put in a message, say what you want. Um, do you want me to do the queue logging in the, in the native Python? Or do you want me to maybe look at something like LogGuru, which is, you know, quite a lot simpler, um, than using the queue log here? And the queue log, again, just as a reminder, is a way to essentially have logging done in a separate thread so that you're not blocking your main application just because you have a lot of logs being written out. It is not a situation that I've encountered, um, certainly, but maybe, you know, your use case, you have a lot of logs and things are slowing down your application. Maybe, maybe think about how much logging you're, you're emitting and whether it's necessary or not. All right, so thanks for watching. I hope you have a better understanding now of the Python uh, logging library in the standard library. Thanks.